we're going to look at where different diuretic drugs act on the nephron to exert their effects. Let's label this nephron with its basic structures, the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. Let's also label the water impermeable thick limb and the water permeable thin limb of the loop of Henle. So drugs like carbonic anhydrase inhibitors act on the proximal convoluted tubule. These are drugs like acetazolamide, which is a non-competitive inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the reaction of CO2 plus H2O to give H2CO3 to give hydrogen ions and bicarb. In the proximal convoluted tubule, sodium is exchanged for hydrogen ions. As carbonic anhydrase inhibitors affect this pathway, fewer hydrogen ions are available for exchange of sodium ions. Throughout these examples, you will see that when sodium is left within the tube of the nephron, it carries with it water, and therefore water is excreted in the urine. Osmotic diuretics act in the loop of Henle. Drugs like mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic, is freely filtered by the glomerulus and is not reabsorbed. Water follows mannitol as the osmolality of the filtrate is increased. So mannitol is stuck within the nephron tube and cannot escape, but it can drag water in with it and that's how it has its diuretic effect. So loop diuretics act mainly on the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle and less so early on in the distal convoluted tubule. They inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. This impairs the countercurrent multiplier system within the nephron and the medulla becomes less hypertonic, so less water is absorbed. Once again, whenever sodium is left within the tube, it will carry water with it and excrete it out. Thiazide diuretics act early within the distal convoluted tubule and act very similarly to loop diuretics. You can see they also inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and chloride ions. With the increased sodium and chloride ions in the tube, more water is excreted. Potassium sparing diuretics act at the distal convoluted tubule and these block sodium and potassium exchange so less potassium is lost in the urine and more sodium remains in the tube. Once again, magically, once sodium is left in the tube, more water is excreted. Aldosterone antagonists are our last class of diuretics. These act at the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. They're competitive antagonists of aldosterone, which is important because aldosterone stimulates the reabsorption of sodium in exchange for potassium. So, if these receptors are blocked, you get no sodium reabsorption, therefore sodium stays in the tube, therefore you lose water. Let's recap. We've got carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, osmotic diuretics, loop diuretics, thiazides, potassium sparing diuretics, and aldosterone antagonists. Examples of aldosterone antagonists include spironolactone. Examples of potassium sparing diuretics include amylaride. Examples of thiazide diuretics are bendorflupathiazide. Osmotic diuretics, as we know, mannitol is really the only one we use, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are weak diuretics, and acetazolamide is an example of this. Probably the most widely used diuretic in critical care and anaesthetics is furosemide, the loop diuretic.